As we continue to think about grit, grace, and gratitude, we return to the story of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded any one of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, you may be seated. Oh, Dr. Luke was a master storyteller. Do you know he was the only New Testament writer who was not Jewish? And Paul referred to him in Colossians 4.14 as the beloved physician. Maybe that's because he had so much concern for the poor and the sick and the outcast, the ones who were on the outside looking in. So as, as he would tell us stories, uh, we would see that with Jesus, things would take an unexpected turn. And especially for first century readers, uh, they were shocked at how the stories would turn out. But Luke knew that God's kingdom, as reflected in Jesus' life, had little resemblance to the kingdom of this world. His stories are some of our favorites in all of Scripture, like this one that you've heard so many times, many of you since a, a child. But they're stories where sometimes it's hard to place ourselves in the story and know what to do about it. When we do, we can say, so that's what life is supposed to be about. And then live it. Then that moment becomes a salvation day when we can live it. A day of great rejoicing for a peace of heaven then will have touched down on earth. So let's first enter this morning's story as one who is hearing it for the first time in the first century. When Jesus spots the well-known chief tax collector, Zacchaeus, in the Jericho sycamore tree, a firm rebuke was surely on its way. After all, this guy and his underlings had been shaking down the people of Jericho for years, charging them way beyond the required tax from Rome. And as a Jew cheating another Jew, getting rich on the backs of fellow Jews, well, that would warrant some pretty harsh words from Jesus, surely. But the reprimand, the scolding, the censure didn't come. Instead, Jesus lovingly calls him out of the tree and invites himself to Zacchaeus' home for dinner. What kind of a dressing down was that? So there was grumbling and complaining. Look, he's gone to be the guest of the one who is a sinner. To sit down and eat with someone like Zacchaeus showed that you approved 
of him. What kind of a Lord would do something like that? Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you take our own lives on some unexpected turns. Give us some surprises, some new meaning to life, some grit and courage to walk into the future, knowing that you go with us. So we measure, can measure ourselves by our abundance and not by what we lack. Take our worries away from us. Let us see glimpses of the heavenly realm. Amen. So with our theme, this is really a story about grit, grace, and gratitude. It took grit for Zacchaeus to come down out of that tree. He knew the way everybody felt about him in Jericho. And he had to be worried at what Jesus, the rabbi, would say to him once he came out of that tree. For he knew his sins all too well. But what grace, what grace was shown from our Lord. Uh, Unwarranted, undeserved, unmerited grace. And then, and then we see the overwhelming grace gratitude from Zacchaeus at his house and in the midst of other tax collectors that were invited to be a part of it. He looks into the eyes of love, into the eyes of God and says, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. And Jesus' response? Well, now that's what salvation looks like. Let's celebrate. Let's rejoice. Be sure that you understand that Zacchaeus did not earn salvation by giving. By resetting the scales, this newfound generosity came as a response to the extravagant generosity of God. I cut out a July op-ed column uh, because it was so um, striking to me. It was by a guy named David Brooks. I don't know how many of you read David Brooks. He's a conservative political commentator who writes... Uh, for the New York Times, and he wrote this article entitled the, Stru- the Structure of Gratitude. So that intrigued me. He starts by saying, I'm sometimes grumpier when I stay at a nice hotel. And then he goes on to say, you know, I expect all the, nice, the, the niceties to happen, and when they don't happen, I get frustrated. Because I paid for them. They should work and work well. He says, I'm sometimes happier at a budget motel. He says, my expectations are lower. A functioning iron as a bonus and a waffle maker in the breakfast area is a treat. He says, gratitude happens when some kindness exceeds expectations and when it is undeserved. Sounds like grace, doesn't it? Gratitude, he writes, is a sort of laughter of the heart that comes about after some surprising kindness. Brooks is intrigued when he sees that some people are grateful dispositionally, that gratitude seems to be just a part of their very nature. He writes that there are people that seem thankful practically all of the time. He observes that most people who get on in life and earn more status often get used to more respect and nicer treatment. He says that people with dispositional gratitude take nothing for granted. 
They take a beginner's thrill at a word of praise, at another's good performance, at each sunny day. Brooks goes on to say that these people are present-minded and hyper-responsive. That they are hyper-aware of their continual dependence on others. That they treasure the way they have been fashioned by parents, friends, and ancestors who were in some ways their superiors. In other words, these people don't get too puffed up thinking that they are bigger than they really are. They're, they're really self-made. Brooks says that people with dispositional gratitude are continually struck by the fact that they are given far more than they pay for and are much night richer than they deserve. Boy, that defi defines me. That they want to repay things forward, perhaps to another person who also doesn't deserve it. He concludes by writing that in this way, each gift you give ripples outward and yokes circles of people in bonds of affection. Ripples outward and yokes circles of people in bonds of affection. Today is stewardship Sunday. And you remember the last Sunday I said that this is the most favorite, my most favorite season of the year. Mike Slaughter, who is the pastor of Ginghamsburg United Methodist, the largest church that we have in our West Ohio Conference, says that attendance during the season of worship, and he always does four Sundays of stewardship, are the highest of any season, including Advent. More people show up during stewardship than any other time of the year. wonder why that is. I love stewardship because I want to have the grit to be dispositionally grateful, to be thankful all the time. That would be my goal. I want to remember that each day I'm blessed by a God in a way that I don't deserve at all. That I'm far better off because of what I've done in giving to others than I was before I gave. And it's all a part of God's amazing, unmerited grace that I'm able to do anything at all. The season of stewardship forces me each year to push that pause and reflect button of my life, to measure the extent I've been following, to which I've been following Jesus and and using my resources to care for His body, the body of Christ, the church, and His people. What have I done for the poor and the disenfranchised in the last year? That's stewardship. And that process each year causes me to fall on my knees in gratitude and say, Lord, take me further. Take me further. And like Peter said to the Lord at the Last Supper when Jesus was washing his feet and he finally understood this grace and this gratitude. And he said to Jesus, if you must wash my feet, then wash my hand. Wash my hair. Wash all over me. And that's what the season of stewardship is about for me. Because I know that stewardship is measured by the difference it makes in me far more than the difference I make in anyone else. In your bulletin today, and many of you received this in the mail, We've published a missional budget for this next year. Already adopted, based on the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and all of us, 
And we're not talking about how many heating and air conditioning units we got in the church. 17. We're not talking about the needs that we have in the kitchen. The old kitchen for a new stove or carpeting or landscaping or anything else. What we're talking about are changed lives in the budget. That's what we need to measure ourselves by. So we're talking about how, how is it that we're going to, in the next year, provide meaningful, life-changing worship each and every Sunday? And what's it going to look like? And how are we going to make that happen? We're going to talk about how we nurture each other in our faith journeys. So as we bring in the, and see the Debbie Beaches of our world, how do we nurture her and others as they come into the fold? And then, how do we witness to our faith and service beyond ourselves? We're going to be entering a in the next year, a, we're going to take our Seize the Day campaign to a whole new level. Uh, so we're going to be talking about resources, but in a joyous way. Because we, you remember, apart from the Lord, we, are, we have nothing. And with Him, we have everything. Uh, and it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time, and it's the most beautiful time in the year for me.